to introduce Mr. Sarakra. He was a chemical engineer, Lafayette, graduated in 2013. He was very active on campus. He's currently pursuing his MBA at Rice University and has a very interesting career path from Lafayette to his current position. So he started at a startup company um, out in Ohio, joined the Army Reserves, brought him to Texas, um, went to business school. So he'll share more about these various paths and what he's up to now. So I won't um, spoil that one. But um, we've asked you to prepare some questions that he'll probably take. So there's a lot of time he'll talk about his experiences, but there's a lot of time built in for uh, Q&A. So look forward to hearing your questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Um, so we're here to call her Lauren. Um, I now and then I'll say professor. Um, so first off, thanks for the great introduction. She is overselling, so I, I sincerely hope I have to live up to about fifty percent of what she said. Uh, again, I think I'm the only thing standing between you and getting drunk. So <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm doing in spring break, right? Now. So, so or, or whatever your 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 you know choice is. Uh, so it's all part of things. Wait. Real quick. So, who are you? So, if there's any chemical engineers in the room, who are the chemical engineers here? Yeah. Alright, awesome. Better question. Who are my non chemicals <laughs> who, who, who do I have? Okay, cool. Cool. So, I've got some, some outside folks. So, so I had asked, uh, I had asked Lauren to, to ask you guys to think about some questions. Uh, and the reason I do that is I've seen it work pretty effectively if you ask for questions up front. If anyone has any themes or ideas of questions, that way I can guide my dog. To hit those questions right away. So, does anyone have any like big questions that, that jumped out as they heard about this thing being advertised? I know it's like no one wants to raise their hand. And, oh, look at that guy. How did you use like a chemical engineering education in the Army Reserves? Okay, okay. So we'll hit that. So CHE education in Army Reserves. All right. Anything else? Um, why did you choose to go for an MBA? Why the MBA? All right, that's always a good question. That's, I think that's why I had a few slides on. Uh, why the MBA? What's life like a startup? What's life like a startup? Awesome. Life at a startup. Anything else? How did you establish credibility as a consultant when you first started out? How did I establish credibility? Awesome question. Shaping me to kind of grow up and become a real person. 
So when you're, when you're, the difference between Madrid and, and Germany, Germany, you travel in Western Europe a lot more, you hit a lot of countries. Spain, you hit a lot of things inside Spain. So that's kind of the difference in the two programs. So as you travel, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about, you know, what do I do when I have five euros left and the train station is about to close, where do I sleep, you know. <laughs> all, all those important life questions. So I studied about sophomore year. Um, the other really cool thing I did sophomore year, uh, which uh, truly shaped me to be an engineer, a real engineer, this is not academic, was um, I started working for the Salsa Man, sitting in the back, Don DeFazio, who is a, uh, Actually retiring this year after a very long 36 years here at Lafayette, so well deserved for him. Um, you know, he, he he has taught me as much, if not more, about engineering than the rest of the faculty combined. So <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious because maybe I'm in trouble. Well, now now that they've already paid for my flight, so I'm good. <laughs> or they said they're going to pay. So um, so I, I work for Tom as a as a lab assistant. You know, they send out a list of jobs. My first job here was working the phonathon, calling one night begging for money. And it's a formative experience. Don't do it for more than a semester. Um, and then I worked with Dom, started washing beakers, essentially sophomore year. He discovered that I was a little, little better than this washing beakers. So as a sophomore, I had the opportunity to be a lab assistant for the ED1 class, uh, which uh, Lauren was teaching at the time, uh, for the juniors. So that was lab assisting a class I hadn't taken yet, because I was able to demonstrate to him that I can understand the equipment, I can understand the safety involved, I can understand the things going on, you know, burning chocolate, all that good stuff you guys do in the mm -hmm. So lab assistant for that class again next year, while I was taking the class, so I would come in on the other section. We, we, our our graduating class was 21, and 21 kind of come up engineers, so you guys are, I think, much larger. And then I did the same thing senior year. So that was a very formative experience in learning, you know, how do things work. Being able to do stuff for him, repairing things, turning wrenches, those are important things. <coughs> Junior, I can't go down. You left something out. When you were a senior, I was taking instruction from you. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 I think that, that, that stage has not come. Um, so ju junior year, I became an RA. I lived in McKean Hall, first floor. Um, that's a lovely floor to be an RA on. Everybody who is uh, intoxicated comes to your floor, <laughs> uses your bathroom, takes your exit sign, and rips your bulletin boards off. <laughs> <laughs> senior year, I became a head RA, a head resident as we call it here. I uh, lived in Conway. That was also a great experience. I got to manage uh, nine staff members, 300 students as a senior. Right? So that's more, most people in most schools don't do that. Uh, left Lafayette, when I became a process development engineer, at Cirrus Inc. That time was called Bioformance. Cirrus was a venture capital backed material science startup. There are few and far between on the list of venture capital backed material science startups. Venture capital backed, venture capital and material science don't mix. So the things you know about, uh, about startups is these fancy people, VCs, will invest in them and they'll get some big return. By big return, I mean you know, 10 to 20x the money they invest there, so they'll invest a couple hundred thousand, they'll get you know, 10, 20, 30 million out of it. That stuff happens for technology companies and it happens very quickly. Right? So whatever it is that kids are using these days as the social media thing, you know, that will blow up instantly, some will make a return, some will move on. Chemical engineering is capital intensive. You need equipment. You need years and years to develop stuff. So it's very rare to find one in that space. We were working on a melodic ester chemistry that had applications in adhesives, sealants, lubricants, all these cool things. We had $22 million raised in our Series A round uh, when I joined right after the round closed. So I was engineer number six, employee number 50. And this was an awesome experience. Three months into my work job there, we had a round of layoffs, laid off like 15 people. About another year of my time there, we laid off another 15 people. So I joined when there was 50 people, I left when there was 20 people at that start. Um, so why do I think that was awesome? Why do you guys think working in a startup would be awesome? Why do you think it would be different between a startup and a large company? Any ideas? Good. I think they give you a larger role to begin with. Larger role, absolutely. It's more like a blind canvas, so you're seeing everything trying to figure it out, seeing what failures and successes. It is. It's easier to move up. It is easier to move up or out. With a less algorithm here today? Less algorithm. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Nice buzzword. Someone else have that over there? Yes, no? It's more different day to day. Sure. Going through promotions. Yeah. So as an engineer, I've got every unit operation there 
Intelligent enough to be dangerous about it, which meant I could break it probably. Um, and I got experience in the entire spectrum of engineering. Design, process development, analytical chemistry. I mean, I ran an MR sample for myself because they didn't have analytical decks to do that. Yeah, having to learn every facet of engineering and how every facet of engineering interfaces with the outside world was fascinating. I turned more wrenches there than I ever had in my life. I, I, I wired control systems myself. I welded tanks to what I needed them to be myself because you know, you don't have any money to yourself. Those things are important to learn as an engineer. If you work at ExxonMobil Air Products, you're going to make a lot of good money and you're going to be in charge of you know, heat exchanger number 1345 and you know, do other unit ops, and you'll do that for a few years, and then you'll move up and then do something else. So at a very young age, being able to you know, say, we've got $20 million, we have no clue how this chemistry works, there's nothing in Aspen to model this, no one knows what the reactions are. Uh, we really don't know what conditions they're distilled us under. We don't know whether we should operate in a vacuum or atmospheric conditions. We have no clue, figure it out man. So, so that I think is awesome. Every day being able to run experiments and say, okay, we did this, I have a hunch why this worked, uh, we'll keep going on this. I don't think I touched a book for like a year. I don't think I touched a spreadsheet for like a year. Because it was, it was using all the knowledge that, that Professor Senra, Professor Giovanni, all those folks gave you in class and in lab, and kind of intuitively applying those. Saying, you know, that doesn't sound right. You know, why isn't that machine locked up over there? Why did this chemistry not work? I need another heat transfer to happen. How can I make that possible? So, you know, th those kinds of questions and being able to influence that on a day-to-day -day basis where you change your process from Monday to Friday, that, that was very exciting. So I did that, I worked in fundraising. It's really hard to raise funds in, in venture capital if you're a material science that company, or a material science company. Um, most people don't understand what's going on. So, especially rich people. They really don't know what, what you're doing, and they're backing a team in a startup. They really have no, they have no interest in the idea. They have very little of an interest in what you do with it. They have an interest in how confident you appear and how well you sell yourself and what they think you can do with it. So by the time we have our second round of layoffs, they handed me the safety role as well and wanted me to be in charge of uh, carcinogenic chemicals, uh, as well as a chemical that was uh, harmful for uh, women of childbearing age and a couple other things. And I was like, I got no training in this. I had no interest in my name being involved in like the next big accident and someone having four heads. So we're not doing this. So I decided to move on from there and I wanted to, to do something else. I said I'll go to, uh, to Houston because you know, Houston is big, full of chemical engineers, full of opportunity, a lot of good jobs, a lot of good things to do. And I wanted to do something different. So I wanted to work for a small company called Philip Townsend Associates. We did benchmarking and consulting and downstream venture companies. So I did consulting before I went to the, uh, the business school route. And what I did there was I was working on advising People at the C-suite level, the executive VP, senior VP level, in big companies, like, hey, what's wrong with your business? And we were doing business management, it wasn't technical. It was like literally high level, you know, your costs here are too high. How do you not see that? And people don't see a lot of things. So I got to travel to Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Colombia, the uh, Middle East, and presented directly to C-suite executives. So why would they let a 24-year-old, 24 and a half year old guy present to C-suite executives? Any yeah, ideas? So, so Professor Sandra would do this thing in ED2 where you would give a presentation and you would videotape it. I think it was ED2. Mm -hmm. And you would videotape yourself and then you had to analyze it. So coming out of coffee, you have a lot of good things. <coughs> if someone tells you you're an initial engineer being compared to someone from Penn State or some of those schools, you have a lot of skills that a lot of people know. So being in a small classroom environment, learning all these, these things of leadership, presenting, those are important. So if I can present in front of a C-suite person at the age of 24, that had to come from somewhere. And that came from the experience that I had here. That came from stuff I learned here in terms of, hey, how do I BS my, myself, my, my way through you know, the next question they're gonna ask me? And how do I not do this with my die, which I did every four seconds in the video like that? <laughs> How do I not appear super nervous and start playing with myself while I'm up here? So, so those, are, those are some of the skills that you have to pick up. So, so, so far, have I talked anything about any of the book formulas you've learned? Have I talked anything about any equations of motion? Which, which formula to apply where? No. And the reason for that is, 
as, as someone asked me about, you know, transition from here to real life or you know, chemical engineering education, most businesses, most people are not going to pay you very large sums of money to be a good engineer. They're going to pay you very large sums of money to be a very good problem solver. I can be a very good engineer in India and Thailand much cheaper than you guys. Much cheaper than you guys. It would, it would behoove me to, to not do that. So the real thing is, if you can apply a formula really well and you're the, the Aspen guru, that's kind of useful. What's even more useful is, can you translate that into simple language and can your friends who are majoring in English over there in Part E understand what you just said? Because if what you just said to them made no sense to them, that's not going to work. So that communication skill, being able to distill something down, that is the value that a lot of chemical engineers should make. You guys have a liberal arts education. Right? That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Most problems in life, most problems in business, most problems at work are people problems. They're rarely systems and process problems. So how do you get through to those people? Right. If, so I have a slide that has something that I'm doing a hand count. Always know, in any more education, especially like, you know, when you try to find out how many stages you need for legislation, know how to do that by hand. Know how to do that a faithful way by drawing it. We had a guy in our class, Scott. He, he wrote a Python program that would figure out the number of stages required. Right? So that's how he did his own work. The rest of us would get a pencil and try to get it as thin as we could to figure out how many stages we needed. Know how to do it by hand. Because you can hire someone to write a Python book. Your value is not writing the Python code. Your value is knowing how to apply the Python code. What, what is that doing? What do I do with that? There, I got bored at some point and decided to join the Army Reserve. You know, why not? We had something to do the weekend. So in the Army Reserve, your commitment is one weekend a month, a couple weeks in the summer, and whenever you get deployed. My job field in the Army is the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. Uh, CBRN stands for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear. Three of those letters, the U.S. has a stated defensive posture, so CBNR. The U.S. does not have any offensive weapons. Nuclear, we do have offensive weapons. So my job is knowing how to decontaminate, uh, you know, someone lets off staring gas here. How do we decontaminate it? How do we stage for recovery? How do we set up so that people don't die? How do we set up so that people can continue living a normal life? Um, so people you've seen big hazmat suits and TV shows? Yeah, that's right. Uh, there, again, I was getting bored of my, my day job. I wanted to do something different. So went and uh, went and decided to do my MBA at Rice in the Jones School. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit, uh, which I'm finishing up in less than two months. So pretty excited to, to have that done with. Uh, and I'm also currently working for my brother's company, New Access Innovation. It's an IT services company. And I, we're, we're about a 70 million, a 70 million <coughs> company. We're advising him. So he's the CEO. I'm advising him directly on what are the steps you need to take to go from 70 million to 5 million. Revenue. So, pretty cool application of exactly what uh, what I'm learning in the MBA. So, I talked a little bit about this. That's the uh, that's the Bremen, Germany. Resident advisor, head resident, talked about that. Talked about Tom, who's featured on my slide. Ooh, another thing I did while I was here, I worked at Microfluidics, did a lot of research. So, back then, the little orange lab in the corner didn't used to exist, and I started working on how do you set up that lab. Again, I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, literally, I probably still don't have. Did. Uh, but the, the concept was being able to apply engineering knowledge of general problem solving, like broad brush strokes of problem solving. Oh, and this thing. Uh, I was also part of uh, um, setting up and characterizing the 3D metal printer that I hear now is in the basement, uh, which, is, which is a true travesty. But um, this thing was awesome. So if you guys ever get a chance to play with a 3D metal printer, everybody's got a 3D plastic printer. That thing's useless. It's a hot glue gun. That's about as sophisticated as a 3D plastic printer gets. Stainless steel, that's where it's at. How it prepared me? Problem solving. Intellectual curiosity and teamwork. These are kind of the big three things that took away from Lafayette. So problem solving. You're going to have to do things in your day jobs that you're going to operate in an environment where there's a lot of information asymmetry. So that I mean, you're not going to have all the information you want or all the information you need, and someone wants you to make a decision. Can you make a decision? Can you defend that decision? Can you make a relatively intelligent decision? It doesn't have to be the right one. You have to have defend, you have to be able to defend it and kind of say I did the right thing. Um, signal noise, there's a lot of noise out there. Can you distill the signal out of those things? So that is what helps you excel as an engineer, not you know, being able to apply the equation of motion better than this guy. Intellectual curiosity, right? So this is a liberal arts kind of thing. Always know the why. 
right? Everyone tells you, like, don't run a pump drive. Who can tell me why you shouldn't run a pump drive? Anybody, come on, somebody. Say what? Notation? Okay, that's a nice word. Anything else? So? Okay, that. <coughs> I'm looking for a really simple answer. Like, like this is going to blow your mind how simple this answer is. How you break it? You'll burn up the seals. You'll burn the pump up. <laughs> yeah, the fluid takes you. <laughs> Literally, half the reason you don't run a pump dry is so you don't burn it up. All that cavitation stuff and cool stuff happens eventually, but the minute it starts going dry is the minute the seals start deteriorating. And the minute the seals start deteriorating, you set yourself up for failure six months down the road because your O-ring blew up and the flip, uh, pump blew up in your face. So know the why. Um, one of the professors here used to say this, the only thing you're learning in Lafayette is you're learning how to learn. That's a very important statement. Right? Education doesn't stop here. The stuff you're learning doesn't stop here. You're going to learn things all the time. So know how to learn. That's the big, biggest thing you can take away from here. I already mentioned know the hand count. It's really important. And monkeys can use it, so monkeys can also use that. Don't be a monkey. Teamwork. Life is not over the wall. We do a really good job. We used to do a really good job of making things over the wall. Engineers rarely operate in a vacuum, right? You're operating with finance people, sales people, marketing people, regular business people. So the over the wall way of doing engineering is that this is the wall, and I'm the engineer designed to ask to design something. I'm going to design something. I'm standing against the wall. I'm going to chuck it over the wall, and then I'm going to go to happy hour because I'm done. Wrong. Most things happen iteratively. Most things happen collaboratively. Collaboratively, you will work with people who have no clue what you're doing. You'll work with people who influence your job, your performance, who have no interest in it. And that might be the least important thing to do all day: is telling the engineer how much something costs, or how much your budget is, or how do you make a budget. And then diversity is important, right? Not just overt diversity. We do a really good job at Lafayette and a lot of other places that Rice as well of talking about overt diversity. That's kind of the uh, you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, some of those things. There's a lot of covert diversity as well that's important. So being in a liberal arts environment, that's covert diversity, right? So you're right, you're getting an engineering education in a school where there are you know, virtually no other majors. You're as engineers able to go study from it. That's diversity. Diversity of thought is important. How many people here are you guys are all seniors, right? You guys are about 21, 22 years old? Anyone 25? 26? No? So Lafayette is a very traditional four-year residential institution. A lot of colleges and schools are not. Right? So we will work with people who have had a very different education than you have had, and they'll start and will work right next to you. Like they were, you know, a single parent, you know, someone who just come back from the army. You know, they, there will be people with all sorts of backgrounds and experiences, and know that, recognize that 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 diversity is important. It's not just all the stuff that we put on diversity banners. How would you convey these things to a potential employer? So, so that's a great question. So, so you use the liberal arts part, part to begin with, right? So at, you have a liberal arts engineering education. You have the opportunity to interact with all these faculty members, all these majors, and that are across the spectrum. Use that. If you have the opportunity to study abroad, use that. Your education, your time here, if you're an RA, if you're working in the gym, I uh, sat in a student, uh, what's it called? Student faculty, yeah, student faculty, uh, uh, committee is the appeals committee. Right, so use those things. Those are all experiences a lot of students don't have. Any kind of leadership thing you've done for a club, those are all things that, that help you stand out. Because a lot of people don't do those. So that's how you convey that you can recognize diversity. You're sitting on a student faculty committee, that's an appeals committee, you're working with faculty, you're working with your students, you're working with people you've never worked with. That's diversity. Being able to understand that their, their viewpoint is important. What about the other two? The life is not over the wall? No. Oh, intellectual curiosity and problem solving? Yes. Oh. So intellectual curiosity is an, is an internal thing, right? Knowing, knowing the why. For me, that always came about in, so for, uh, I love languages. And English is not my first language. Uh, so you know, being able to tell people, hey, I'm learning a new language. I'm working on German these days. I was working on German when I was uh, in, in my senior year. I was working on Russian at some point. I was learning to read Russian before I went to Russia. Um, that's intellectual curiosity, telling people that you're interested in all these facets. Um, being journalists, going to, going to conferences. Sounds really boring. They usually have free food and free alcohol, so that's a plus. But doing those things helps. Problem solving? Literally everything you do is problem solving, right? If you are not solving a problem, then you're probably doing something wrong, right? Whatever, whether it's a team project, whether it's, you know, the person on your team is not getting along with you, 
whether it's, you know, you, you do use the date and you don't get along anymore. Those problems are all real problems. Problems are not like, oh, well, I'm in a penicillin. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Not everybody has penicillin. There's a lot of other problems in life that come along the way. So, yeah. Think deep and, and think hard about all the things you do on a daily basis, and I guarantee you, you will find problems. All right, moving on. Ready to school. So why business school? So I told you I wanted to go to business school. Uh, there's a couple of reasons up here, and I'll talk about them. So the first was, people choose to go to business school for a few reasons. So people will go to business school because they want to invest in themselves. It's one of the few things that, like, is literally a direct investment. You get an education, it typically helps you get a better job. You can quantify that. And it also serves as a career reset. And this is a career reset for a lot of people. Say you work in engineering for a couple of years, and you hate it. You're like, you know what, screw this. I really don't want this. I hate being in a plant. I hate looking at this stuff. You know, no one ever talked to me about bumps and suction head anymore, ever. And you're like, well, how can I get out of this? You go to grad school. Framework for problem solving. All right, so, so the MBA gives you a framework for problem solving in things outside of engineering. There are a lot of different problems out there to be solved. Supply chain. Uh, I'll give you a supply chain problem. Uh, in, in the United States and the Gulf Coast, in the next, the next three years, there's over one billion pounds of additional plastics capacity coming on. That's polyethylene, polypropylene, those nice things you use every day. What do you think their biggest problem is right now? Well, I guess collection? In terms of like getting it? Okay, no, that, so that's the that's issue we're recycling. So these guys are making this from scratch. Oh, methylene, they're making it from scratch. But it's a good idea. Anybody else? Sending it out. Sending it out. Awesome. Okay. <coughs> So their biggest problem is not building the plant, manning the plant. You can build, you can produce a billion pounds with like 20 people, maybe, maybe less. Their biggest problem is how do you get it out of here? There is no demand in the US for that material. So where does it go? All goes out outside the US. How does it go there? Well, it goes on ships. Okay, how do you get it to a ship? Does the US have a sophisticated or an unsophisticated train network? Unsophisticated. unsophisticated. So how do you get it to a port? You're trucking. What is one of the biggest problems in hiring these days? You cannot hire truckers. Why do you think you can't hire truckers these days? Everybody fills a drug test. So you just built a shiny $1 billion or several billion dollar plant to produce this really awesome polyethylene, and you are screwed because people will smoke pot and they can't pass a drug test. That is your problem. And the, the engineering of polyethylene is not your problem. How do you get it out of that, the, the, the ship channel in Houston is not big enough to accommodate the, big ship, the biggest super tankers these days. So you have to truck it from Houston to Atlanta or Houston to Long Beach, California. That's a problem. It's not a very efficient system, but that's how we do it. So problems exist in all these things, and you have to have that framework for understanding that problem. Meaning for the network. Networking is something you always hear is the most awkward thing. It is like maybe next. I mean, awkward next to you, who says the first thing when you match on Tinder is like really hard to really hard to master. Uh, no one has mastered it, so it, it 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 should be exactly like you do Tinder, like a shotgun blast. Just talk to anyone you can see, say 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 something. I mean, who knows what sticks, right? Who knows? It it, it, it can work on it. Um, and then you were exposed ideally to diversity. Right? So if an MBA has folks from outside of engineering, folks from outside of you're regular. I have people with me who you know, taught English in Korea for three years, and, and now they're doing MBA. That has nothing to do with engineering, it has nothing to do with my background, but they have something to teach me. Other options? There are other management <coughs> educations these days. A lot, of, a lot of things have popped up. You can do a master's in finance, you can do a master's in marketing, real estate, all this cool stuff. You could be an engineer, right? You could go get a master's in engineering. It could also be a career kickstart. I did not do this because, one, I wasn't sure I wanted to continue in engineering. Two, the master's in engineering very rarely pays for, pays for itself. Very, very rarely. The master's in engineering does not pay for itself. It works if uh, you have had the unfortunate circumstance, which I, I'm sorry to tell you, you probably faced at some point in your life if you've been laid off, and you've been out of work for quite a while, and you cannot find work, and there's a huge gap on your resume, go get a master's, it will give you a restart. So, so some of these things are not as, as beautiful as just saying, hey, I want to get a master's because I love, you know, H. Scott Fogler, and I really want to go do this, which, you know, my club is H. Scott Fogler. Um, so some of these things are not, these are very real life issues. Because once you live here, like real life in terms of paying bills, and you know, 
doing some of those things becomes pretty important. PhD, you always do a PhD, right? So I still want to do a PhD at some point. So I want to go back to get a doctorate. I don't know in what. Maybe economics, maybe international law, maybe something with that nature. That option is always there. Going backward is kind of hard. You can, you can always go forward to get a PhD. A lot of folks at MBA will work for several years, start a business, sell a business, and go get a PhD in economics or business, and they'll teach in business school. Teaching in business school is, is, is like way easier than anything the professors in this room are doing, because there's like very little research requirement. The business school pays for itself. You don't have to write any grants. Um, or you get a professional degree, right? I know people, the JD MBA these days is like very, very popular. Um, a lot of schools are offering a joint JD MBA. Or people will do an MBA go on to get a, a, a law degree because I guess they want one. And you can always go to med school and you can read what it says. Because uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you do that yourself. So how do you get to B school? You get to B school by taking those standardized tests. Awesome. Take a GMAT, most big schools will, check it, will take a GMAT. Here's the other cool thing. Most big schools will also accept the GRE. What else can you use the GRE for? Like every other master's. So if you're kind of on the fence, and you're like, hey, I want to do a master's in engineering, go to the GRE. Scores about for five years. Right. So this is what the profile looks like. So at Rice, the, the GMAT is scored out of 800. Rice, the medium is 710. Percent of the GRE is 22%. So quite a few people had, had other ideas. Work experience. This is pretty, pretty normal for business school, about five to six years. And so that means by the time you graduate, you'll be about 20 years old. So the decisions you think you'll make now are going to be very different from the decisions you'll make five years from now. You may have a serious girlfriend, boyfriend, a kid, you may have a take care of a parent, you may be working somewhere else in a different country. There's a lot of things that go on in life. Very few good business schools will accept you without work experience. So top business schools mandate work experience. They used to be the thing back in the 50s after World War II where you know you could you could go to B school with zero experience, not the case anymore. And some other stuff, you can write some letters, uh, write some essays, get some letters, all that good stuff that you need. Here's some statistics about rice in terms of who goes there. About 31% female in our class. This is on the higher end. Usually it's much lower. MBA is still very skewed. So our chemical engineering class was very neatly balanced. I think we were 50%-ish, uh, female and male. Um, MBA school is not, business school is not like that. STEM majors, rice is actually overemphasized on STEM. Because it's in Houston, so literally everyone is in the petroleum industry. Uh, typically, about 22% of people who take the GMAT come from STEM backgrounds. That doesn't mean 22% of MBAs have STEM backgrounds, it just means people who took that test. So that's some indication. Actually, 35% of our people have advanced degrees. What does that mean? They have, or they have a master's, they have a doctorate, or they've got an MD. We've got a lot of MDs doing MBAs because they're bored. Um, or they're moving into administration on the medical side and they just want some more credibility. Types of business school, I'll go through this real quick. There are kind of four types of business school that I think of. Full-time, that's a very traditional, in-residence, two-year degree. That's what everyone thinks of when they think of an MBA. There are some one-year degrees, I don't know about those. Um, that's just kind of weird. Um, professional, this is what a lot of people will do. You take classes in the evening. I did that my first year. So I took classes in the evening, worked in the morning. It was very miserable. I recommend not doing it. Um, or you can do weekend classes as well. And this is two to four years. Um, Rice forces you to do all degrees in two years. So think about a full-time, daytime curriculum fixed into the evening classes and still make you graduate in two years. So that means like no breaks, all summer classes, all this good stuff. The reason for that, why do you, why do you think they did it? Why do you think they make you graduate in two years? Very practical question. Get more people. See more people. Okay, that's it. Oh, that's it. That's a great one. Force you to better manage your time. That is also a, a, a possibility. Not the answer, but anybody else? Does that to lose interest that way? That is, that, is, that is true. A lot of people do lose interest. There is a stigma amongst employers if you take longer than two years to complete your MBA. So, amongst top employers, by top employers, I mean management consulting firms, investment banking firms, the Goldman Sachs of the world, if they see an MBA for longer than two years and you can't explain it with, like, you know, I got pregnant and had a kid, I got deployed, you know, something happened, that's a, that's a negative thing. Is that a nice thing? No. But hey, that's how it is. So unfortunately, the truth of it is, MBAs that take longer than two years, um, career opportunities for those people are limited. Executive, it's a very different profile. That's where all those doctors go. That's where business people who have had their business for years, they're bored, they just want to do this. 
most of our people who are in the American program are like very successful. Yeah, they're driving Lamborghinis. They, they don't need to be in school. They just do it for fun. Um, that these online hybrid ones, I have no clue about them. That's that's like pure dark work. So, so I have nothing to, to tell you about those. What do you do at B school? So that's actually not what you do at B school. That's what you do. Um, no, there's no partying. There's no Coachella. Um, what you do at B school is kind of roughly divided into two things, right? You do academic stuff. You do non academic stuff. Academic stuff is fairly easy. There's a core curriculum. You learn some finance, some accounting, you yeah, some practice some stuff. But the most math theory I have is, is like something based to power or something. That's like, well, I think I'm on side of the um, That's like the most math you have to do ever. Um, so that's that's the core curriculum. Every MBA across the country will have learned finance, accounting, marketing, and organizational behavior. And then you take some electives and you concentrate in something finance, entrepreneurship, those are two I'm doing, you know, real estate, marketing, operating. There's like a bajillion. Typically, every school also has a global field experience. I went to Chile for about 10 days. It was awesome. You typically, what they do is they'll pair you with a business in that country, and then you get to see what their problems are, what are the kind of issues the businesses in other countries have. Extracurricular. This is where the money's at. This is what this business school is mostly about. Right, so, business school has a singular aim of getting you a job. Why do they want you, want you, why do they want you to get a job? Make their program look good. Make the program look good. Similar, similar answer. What else? You get money and give back to the school. Yes, yes. <laughs> People love naming buildings after themselves, especially males. We love naming stuff after ourselves. So you go, you make it big, you give a couple million dollars, you get a name on a building. Awesome, right? That is why they want you to get have good outcomes because it is a self-serving, a self-fulfilling process. So this is where a lot of this stuff happens, right? They're schmoozing. There's professional clubs that you can participate in, like consulting, operations, marketing. There's social clubs. There's like ample opportunities to have, uh, have, have fun. The real two things that I think are fun are the schmoozing and the outside speakers and network. So at the end of the day, outside of B school, you will come to find out. Again, this is unfortunate. I don't think this is the way it should be. But who you know matters. It matters a lot. And having the opportunity to access that network, I can I can reach out to anyone in the Rice Network. Um, and you know, ask them for a job, and they'll probably get, get you a job somehow. So that is important. So all those outside speakers, billionaires will come in and they'll be talking for days and days. So those opportunities are hard to find otherwise. So that's, that's where the real, real meat of business school is. So okay, you've gone to business school. Um, how do you pay for this, right? So business school is typically expensive, very expensive. Uh, so the direct cost is in the top 20 school, about sixty thousand dollars a year. So a two-year degree, about hundred thousand uh, dollars. For me, Uncle Sam is paying that, so thank you guys for paying your taxes and paying for my MBA. Um, others, uh, once you get outside of the top twenty, you're looking at twenty-five to fifty grand a year. So about hundred grand or fifty grand. Indirect cost, very painful, very painful. So you guys have had like a whole economics lecture at some point. I think Michael used to do that uh, engineering economics or something. Yeah, he, I know he used to do some stuff like that. Does anyone know what opportunity cost is? What is an opportunity cost? Simple terms. If I have a Snickers bar and a Twix bar, and I pick the Twix bar, what is my cost? So the opportunity cost is not being able to eat the other thing. Yeah, so the direct cost is the cost of the Twix, and the opportunity cost is not being able to do the thing. So if you're doing a full-time MBA for two years, what are you not doing? Not working. Right? So when you look at the true cost of a, like a top 20 MBA, Given where you're coming from to do a top 20 MBA, the kind of job you're leaving, it's about a half million dollars. Is the, the full cost of doing a top 20 MBA. All right. So if you're the kind of person who's going to Harvard, Stanford, Morton, Chicago, Kellogg, when Rice has just broke into the top 10, Darden, any one of these big schools, you're probably making good money, right, by age 26, um, and you're probably making good bonuses. So you're you just you just for, you just, you just have to forego all of those. So true cost is probably close to that. So that's why it's important that, you know, these are important things to understand, right? It, why do you want the MBA? Do you want the MBA because you want to change your career and accelerate it, or do you want your MBA because you want to keep working the same job? If you do a professional program, you want to keep working the same job because the work will pay for it and you get a little bump at the end and you, know, you don't have to, you have no cost coming out of it. If you want to take that big leap, you know, then there is there's something associated with it. Scholarships, typically only full-time. Only full-time students will get scholarships. If you're doing one of those evening classes, 
typically getting out of law school to get scholarships. And they're typically going substantial scholarships. Loans, this is the other way to pay for it. Um, if you don't have a first warrant to sell, or you don't want to sell it. Um, average debt for 2016, about $80,000 to $100,000 when you graduate. All right, so you can add that on to whatever debt you may or may not have from undergraduate, and whatever else you're doing in your life, you probably own a house, you probably have a mortgage. Um, so the debt, debt burden becomes pretty, pretty heavy. So most people will take like several years to pay this debt. Like 20 plus years. Why do you think they do that? Why do, you, why do you think that someone who may get a job straight out of business school and have a signing bonus, well, close to maybe not eighty thousand, but fifty thousand dollars signing bonus? Why do you think they don't pay, pay it paid off majorly? So this is an important answer to someone asking the question about transition from school to real life. So when I got out here and I was I was I was like a hotshot, you know, just got an engineering degree, you know, I can do awesome things. I knew a daily squat about finance. Like straight up daily squat. So Americans spend about a third of their life at least at work, about eight hours a day, if not more. That work gives you a paycheck. Most people are horrible at managing that paycheck and are horrible at managing money. So the reason they don't pay that off immediately is you can deploy that capital much more effectively elsewhere. So if you get a bonus, I could probably invest that. My, my student loan interest rate might be too bad my student loan, but let's say it's 2%, 5%, whatever it is. You can probably find an investing opportunity that generates more money than 5 7%. So that's why you'll take forever to pay that off. So, so these are things you should think about and, and know going into you know, getting out of Lafayette is how do you manage money? That's important, whether you go to business school or not. That's, that's an important thing to know. We have talks coming up, second half of the semester about that. There you go. <laughs> there, you go. <laughs> there you go. So what do you get in return? Compensation? Top 10 averages. So, one other thing. There's like a, there's like a saying about you know, lies, the end lies, and statistics. So what did I just do? I'm lying to you in one way, at least one way. What did I just do? Is it top 10 averages? What did I, do? What did I say before that? You're on the right track. I gave you the cost of attendance for top 20 school. I didn't give you the composition of top 10 school. So in life, be very careful when people give you statistics. Like, it is very important to understand where statistics come from when people quote these. This is like a journal life thing. Like when people, someone quotes a number or a percentage or a stat, know where it came from. This just happened to me wherever I would look up yesterday at the airport. Um, compensation, top and average, this is what you're looking at on 30K, 30K bonus, um, signing bonus, probably a 15 to 20% annual bonus. So I think like last year, Harvard had a guy who got hired at 250K uh, instead of the salary. Right? That's we all love the normal distribution, that's on this side. Your nonprofit guys, they're on this side. Why would you go work for a nonprofit coming out of the MBA other than the passion, right? You know, there's a passion part of that. What else do you do? Or a lot of them back by government subsidies for your loans. Yes. Something. So either the government or the school will forgive your loan because for the school it looks good to have more people go work in a nonprofit. So they will forgive part of your loans if you work at a nonprofit for two years. So Median salary into your career, right? You're looking at 130, 150k. For management consulting for this year, median starting salary is about 150k. With the start signing bonus about 45k. Intangibles, management fast track. And you are fast tracked as a 26, 28 year old to do things that people have spent years and years doing. So you will be managing people much younger than you. That's a problem. How do you go tell someone? Oh, much older than you. How do you go tell someone who is 55? You know what to do. That's a skill that you can apply some of the things you've learned at Lafayette and working with people, you can apply that skill. Hidden paths. So all those jobs I mentioned, you get through your network. So the best jobs, those $250,000 jobs, those don't come on job boards. Those don't come through LinkedIn. Those don't come because there was an application that you could apply and submit your resume. Those, become, those come because you knew someone who has known you and kind of knows where your talents and passions are. This is a long sell. Like, this is very long sell. You gotta know someone who knows someone, and that's how you get that. What kind of jobs can you get, right, other than this one? Um, <laughs> the most common career paths are in tech. You can go be a product manager for a tech company, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, any of those guys, IBMs, Cisco's. Finance, you can go work in a corporate finance role. Those, things, those guys make a lot of money. Investment banking, you go work at Goldman Sachs, Barclays. Uh, those guys make a lot of money. Management, 
general management jobs. This includes engineering. A lot of good engineering companies, BSF has one of the best leadership development programs. You can, you can get hired straight into that uh, in the leadership rotation program. Management consulting, which is what I'll be doing, working at KPMG and strategy consulting. Uh, in marketing roles, marketing. If anyone knows or you figure out in your life that you know how to do marketing, go, go do an MBA because CMO, Chief Marketing Officer, is really hard to find. A good Chief Marketing Officer is really, really hard to find. Marketing is a skill that is partly innate, partly taught. So if you're good at marketing, that is not a bad career path. And of course, real estate, that, that, that people tend to overlook that one. Um, these are some of the kinds of roles we're going to be doing. So I've talked a lot about some random stuff. Um, how my fellow business industry is preparing me, I think I've mentioned a little bit about that, why do you need about that? Life in a startup, right, so it's very fast paced, there are a lot of things that 24 year olds and 23 year olds aren't doing. Um, I pitched to VCs who are running billion dollar funds, I pitched to VCs at corporate, so there are two types of VCs, there are VCs who are really rich and like, deploying money, and then there are VCs who are corporate. That means like Exxon has a venture arm, Starbucks <coughs> has a venture arm, BSF has a venture arm. So I pitched to those guys who were like engineers doing this, and having no clue what I'm telling them, but still had to somehow maintain a straight face and be able to explain to them well what I was doing. And there's an art in how you how you handle things you don't know. There's a lot of things people don't know. So you can still present stuff you don't know. Um, credibility. Credibility in management consulting, or credibility in consulting, um, a lot of times it comes from the degree, so the credential of having an MBA, that helps. Um, the other way to get credibility is, is knowing your stuff really well. So I would have clients in my medical consulting job give me data and I would know their data better than them. Like down to the deal, like hey, you said you know, three years ago your indirect cost of that plant was $56.10 a pound, but now it's $58.20 a pound. So knowing that data, once you can prove that to someone and you can stop their question in their tracks, that is such credibility, otherwise it's really hard to Also, being good at presenting. Presenting controls are very important. Um, transition from school to real life, you know, the biggest thing that caught me off guard was the finance thing, so know a little bit about, about finance. Um, and also know a little bit about you know, how do you navigate not just that career, but the roles you're going to have after that. So I'm going to pause there and say a lot of random stuff. Uh, what kind of questions do you guys have now that you've heard me talk a little bit? What did you say you're doing after you finish? So I'm working for a company called KPMG, it's one of the big four uh, accounting slash consulting firms, um, and I'll be working in their strategy consulting role. What that means is people come in and say, hey, uh, you know, we don't know whether we should launch uh, box diapers or bag diapers. And they say, do a product this company, the company says that. Or a, a clothing company comes and says, we don't know whether we should make fleece jackets or fleece vests. What should we do? Those kinds of questions. So I'll be working on that stuff. Go ahead. Um, what's the difference between going to business school at night and Understanding about that? About what? No, uh, just the, going to business school at night. Yeah, so, so there's a few few ways to think about that. One is um, the professional programs where you can go to business school in the evening, there's two types of those. There's one that is cohort based, which means you're with a group of people, and there's another one which is uh, kind of self based. That's where someone here said you lose interest, right? And uh, that's the one that takes longer than four years to do. The, the difference is full time, you quit your job, you go to school in the morning, just like this, you have classes through to 4 p.m. or something, and that's all you have your full time student. Going to school in the evening, you have a day job, right? Day jobs are not always fixed. My classes started at 6.15 p.m. and at 9.30 p.m. So I had a full day of work from 8 a.m. to 5, maybe 6, sitting in class, still answering emails, still taking calls every now and then. So that's the big difference is in what how you manage your time, what kind of attention you can devote to it. You don't have a lot of time to go to networking events. You don't have a lot of time to go to these social events. You, you can't participate in your book too much if you've got a day job. So, so those are some of the, the tactical differences in, in the you know, day to day. The real difference is the value of the MBA comes in networking. It comes in knowing your classmates. It kind of comes from knowing the alumni, but it comes from knowing your classmates. Because like, you know, seven years from now when XYZ, my class gets it big and launches a new company, and they need someone to come work there, who are they going to look to? They can look to their classmates. So that's the biggest difference is the, the, the touch you get and the interaction you get. Other questions about, about engineering, working in startup, business school, graduate school, other random stuff. What's up? What made you pick 
<coughs> the like engineering business side of things as opposed to research? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I actually think uh, faculty members at some point were convinced I was going to go do a PhD because I was doing uh, Excel work, I was doing Microfluidics, I was doing honors thesis, uh, 3D printing stuff. I, I was fully on the research track. I think what did it for me was at that point in time, I don't think I was ready to commit to one particular area of research. I was interested in material science, I was interested a little bit in you know, bio, I was a little bit interested in you know, some other random stuff. I was like, you know, I don't want to go into something right now at age 22, just kind of sort of knowing what I'm going to do, and then end up six years later, five, four to six years later, however long it takes you, not everyone can finish a PhD as fast as a Warren can. Um, you know, however long it takes you to do that, um, you end up with a highly specialized degree, and at that point, going back is really hard. Now you're very over specialized uh, for most jobs, so finding a regular job is really hard. Um, and that was just a lot of uncertainty at that time that I didn't want to do. That's why I said, yeah, I can always go back and be that you know, random weirdo who gets a PhD at age 30. Um, that, that was the biggest driver for me. And also, an engineering business, the thing is, once you go, go out and work in engineering, all the decisions are made by business people. At the end of the day, the, uh, most firms exist to generate profit or return, and most of those decisions are made by business people. And as an engineer, they make very, very frustrating decisions. They make very, very stupid decisions. Like, every now and then you'll hear someone talk about, like, you know, this, this is a classic example we used to give in the VC world was, you know, you'd say, oh, well, I need this special problem that needs to be backed with this, or it needs to be this many trays tall, and it's literally not going to be in our facility. Well, can't you put it sideways? No, no, I can't. <laughs> no, this special problem does not go in sideways. <laughs> go back, don't flip 200, go away. Um, so decisions are made by people who are, who are very dangerous because they don't know this craft. So an engineering plus business education is pretty powerful because it, yeah, as an engineer, you're an innate problem solver. You might not know it yet, but you're a problem solver. How do you apply that to areas where they generate lots and lots of money and, and talk about big decisions? Because a plant engineer, a plant manager can make some decisions that affect his plant. The CEO makes decisions that affect big garbage, like you know, of his, of his uh, plant. So, so some of you have class, so yeah. let's pause here, but we do have some more time. So if you don't have to head out right now,